on chapter 2, we're preaching through the book of Ruth. I'm going to do a quick, a brief summary and review of what we went through in uh, Ruth chapter number 1. The, the book starts off by telling you the characters, of course. Naomi is married to Elimelech. They are of Bethlehem, Judah. And there's a great famine. They leave the land and they go to the land of the Moabites. And the, that the reason that they left was because of the famine. That was the sole reason. I'm going to be touching on that here in just a minute. But they leave the land and they, uh, of, of Bethlehem, Judah, and they go to the land of the Moabites. And they have two children, Malon and Kilion. While they're there, Naomi's husband, Elimelech, passes away. He dies. So, and after he dies, immediately thereafter, it says that Malon and Kilion, both of her sons, they marry two Moabitish women. And it was Orpah and Ruth. Orpah and Ruth. Uh, you know, time goes on, I believe it says 10 years, and Malon and Kilion, both of her sons die. And she dwells in the land, it doesn't tell you for how long, the land of the Moabites. It doesn't tell you exactly how long that that is. But she dwells in the land for a period of time, and then she hears, you know, just by word of mouth, that the Lord had visited her people, that is the nation of Israel, in giving them bread. So the famine is over, so she decides to go back. And Orpah and Ruth say they're going to go with her. Well, while they're traveling, you know, uh, uh, Naomi stops and tells them, you know, don't come with me. You know, I don't have any more kids. I'm too old to have any children. Just turn back and go back. Well, Orpah decides to go back, but it says that Ruth was steadfast that she was going to go. And she makes a profound statement. She says, thy people shall be my people. And then she, she says this, and thy God, my God. And then after that, she makes a vow to the Lord that, that nothing but death should, would depart them to where God would you know, take her own life if that were to happen. It, then it records her coming into the town. And when she does, you know, there's a great stir in the city. And then it ends in verse 22 telling you the period of time in which this took place. Of the year, that is, and it says they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. Now, barley harvest, just so you know, the time of year is from around March to May. That's when barley harvest actually takes place, and the year prior is around November. That is according to our calendar, of course. Around November is when they, October, November is when they, be, they would begin, you know, uh, plowing and laying seed. And then they actually go to harvest the barley in March or May. Now, I'm going to reference that in just a moment. We're going to begin reading in our chapter for tonight. In verse number one, the Bible says, And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech. And his name was Boaz. Boaz, verse number two. And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. Now I want to explain something to you because I can see how someone could easily misunderstand this. And that is verse number one. That verse is an introductory verse. That verse is not telling you that she is aware that she is going to Boaz's field. It actually tells you in, in verse number three that she happened upon this. That it was just chance. So verse number one is just introducing the character. I liken this when I read this. Any serious Bible student knows what is the law of first mention in the Bible. And what the Bible does is it defines a word for you. So before it starts talking about Boaz, they want to tell you who Boaz is. So verse number one is just introducing the character of the person of Boaz and who he is. And it says that he's a kinsman of her husband's a mighty man of wealth. So he has great wealth. He has great resources. Most of the time at that point, you know, they, currency as far as just money and gold and things like that is not what people possessed. It was their, they measured their wealth based upon, you know, their, their land, you know, how much fruit that they had as in all produce that is, wheat, things like that, their animals, all of their resources. So he was a mighty man of wealth. It says, of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. Verse number two again, And Ruth the Moabite has said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. Now, first I want to define something for you as well. What did verse number 22 at the very end say? I, I told you that was going to become relevant. What time of the year was it? It was barley harvest. Now, notice immediately that she tells you here in verse number two that she is going to go glean ears of corn. That is because the word corn in the Bible, and you can research this. I'm going to show you a couple of verses. The word corn is not what we would think of as corn in the Bible. I want you to turn over to, uh, first let's go to Isaiah chapter number 36. 
verse number 17. The word corn refers to uh, a food or a, or a product in a raw form. It's normally referring to like a seed, and it almost all of the time is not only just referring to a seed, it's referring to a wheat or a barley. And, that, and I want you to turn, like I said, to Isaiah 36, verse 17. A perfect example of this is in John 12, when Jesus makes the statement talking about how he has to go to the cross. He says, except a corn of wheat fall to the ground. And notice what he said there, except a corn of wheat. So it's a corn of wheat, saying it's like a seed of wheat. That's what you would refer to a, a, a seed is what we would call it, but it says except a corn of wheat. And what time of the year is it? Barley harvest. We're going to see that she's actually going out and she's gleaning barley, but it refers to it as corn. So I said Isaiah chapter number 36, verse number 17. Isaiah chapter number 36, verse number 17 is a perfect example of this. We learn by studying things that are repeated. Isaiah 36, 17 says this, Until I come and take you away to a land like, like unto your own land, or like your own land, a land of corn and wine. Okay, he says corn and wine. He repeats it and he says this, a land of bread and vineyards. So what does vineyards line up with? Wine. wine. So therefore, what does bread line up, line up with? Corn. What is wheat? What is barley? Right? You understand what I'm saying? It's bread. So corn here would be bread. It would be wheat. It would be barley. I'll give you one more quick example of this. Uh, I want you to turn to... Uh, let's go to Amos chapter number 8, verse number 5. Amos, that's in the Minor Prophets. Amos chapter number 8, verse number 5. Hosea, Joel, Amos. Again, that's Amos chapter number 8, verse number 5. He says, saying, when will the new moon be gone that we may sell corn? So he's saying, when is the new moon going to be gone that we may sell corn? And the Sabbath, so he's repeating himself, that we may set forth wheat. So notice what he substitutes. What's synonymous there? Corn and wheat. So it makes perfect sense she's showing up at the time of barley harvest, right? She's going out to reap the barley. To glean means to gather. That's what that means, to gather something. Glean is synonymous with gather. And when she's going out there and she says she's going to glean ears of corn, it's not what we would think of as ears of corn in our modern vernacular. It's actually speaking of wheat. There's other examples of this. Over and over again in the Bible, you'll see bread and wine coupled together, but you'll also see corn and wine. Like when Jacob uh, blesses, uh, or when Isaac blesses Jacob, it's, he blesses him with the sustenance of the land of corn and wine. When Joseph is in Egypt, you have, uh, you have them, they come to him and he, they beg them. You remember when everybody sells their land and everything for all the foods and everything? Well, they come to them and they beg them. They ask them, you know, please just give us corn that we may eat. Give us corn. And you know what he gives them? He gives them bread. They're asking for corn and he gives them bread because corn is bread. It's the same thing. They're synonymous. Corn is just a reference to it being a seed. It's still in its raw form. It still is a seed. That's why Jesus Christ said, except a corn of wheat. He's saying a seed of wheat is what he's referring to. Uh, one other thing I want to point out is you know, uh, this idea of, in chapter number two of Ruth and Naomi, which are both widows, and Ruth specifically being a widow and going to just any just land that she sees, anyone's land or anyone's uh, field, if you will, and gleaning in their field, this isn't something she came up with in her, in her own mind or something along those lines. This is actually biblical. This is a practice from the Old Testament law. Now, I want you to turn back and we'll look at this quickly. I want you to go to Leviticus chapter number 19, verse number 9. Make sure to keep your hand in Ruth. We're going to continually come back to Ruth. So it's Leviticus chapter number 19, verse number 9. We'll see that God ordained this. It's interesting when you see God ordained things and then it actually being put into practice. Like the Bible talks about pouring, uh, using running water. Right? Using running water. And this, it's, it's, that is interesting from a scientific perspective because that is far, the Bible is far beyond man science and anything that man can come up with. Because it, it took, I think it was like, what was it like, the early 1900s, so the early 20th century when they were birthing babies in Australia. And they kept just like dipping their hands after one doctor would go in and he would birth a baby. And they had this community basin, they would just dip their hands in that basin. So, you know, women have diseases, there's all different types of blood-borne diseases, and they're just washing their hands. Like five doctors are just birthing babies in this center. They're washing their hands, and that actually led to the discovery of, like, blood-borne diseases, and, and especially using running water. 
That actually, they learn things about diseases from that as well. But specifically what I'm talking about right now is using running water. How, how you know, the importance in health of using running water. Why it's not good that bacteria just stays sitting in the water and they're just dipping their hands in that and just putting it back on their hands. So health purposes, the importance of that. And that's why the Bible says specifically running water. Not just water. And then you see that played out with who? Does anybody remember? You have Elijah and Elisha. And Elisha being the servant of Elijah, do you know what he did? He poured water on his hands. He didn't have a basin that he presented with him. He poured water on his hands. Why? It's biblical. He had running water. He washed his hands in running water, being obedient. And it's cool when you actually see those things actually being practiced out Amen. in the Bible. So Leviticus chapter number 19, verse number 9, the commandment given unto the children of Israel, it says, And when you reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not wholly reap. So holy is like completely, right? Thou shalt not wholly reap the corners of thy field, neither shalt thou gather the gleanings of thy harvest. Verse 10, And thou shalt not glean thy vineyard, neither shalt thou gather every grape of thy vineyard. Now earlier I said that gleaning meant to gather. That is true, but that is a simplistic, that is a very simple definition of it. To glean means to gather completely or, or wholly. Like we see here when he says, Thou shalt not glean thy vineyard, then he says, Neither shalt thou gather every grape. So you notice that? It means to gather everything. To glean something means to gather every bit of it. So he says, Thou shalt not glean thy vineyard, neither shalt thou gather every grape of thy vineyard. Thou shalt leave them. Now watch this. For the poor and stranger, I am the Lord your God. Go over to Deuteronomy chapter number 24. We get a little bit more insight on this. Deuteronomy chapter number 24. Deut the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy actually means second law. What that means is... <clears throat> That the law is repeated a second time. So the law is given in Exodus and Leviticus, and then it's repeated in the book of Deuteronomy for the second time. So we compare Scripture to Scripture, we can learn more about it. Just like comparing the Gospels. So that's, like I said, Deuteronomy 24. I believe it's verse 19. <clears throat> yeah, very end of the chapter. When thou cuttest down thine harvest in thy field, and hast forgot a sheep in the field, thou shalt not go again to fetch it. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless. Now watch this. And for the widow. And what was Ruth? What was Naomi? They were both widows, correct? And for the widow, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hands. That's an interesting statement that he makes at the end right there. He says that you should leave it for them. Why? That he may bless you. Because he'll bless you if you do right unto the, the fatherless. You always see God over and over again commanding you know, uh, the children of Israel to take care of those that are weak or have infirmities. When Jesus comes and he walks on this earth, you see the Lord giving the, the Old Testament... And then you see Jesus, you know, which is the Lord in the flesh, actually on the earth, acting it out. What does he do? He goes to those that are sick, those that are in need, those that are hungry, the fatherless, the widow. He heals people, with the man with the withered arm. You can see that he cares for those that have infirmities. Look at verse 21. When thou gatherest the grapes of thy vineyard, thou shalt not glean it afterward. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. Verse 22, here's the reason. And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt. Therefore I command thee to do this thing. So it's supposed to do what? You know what that means? That's supposed to keep you humble. That's supposed to keep them humble and realize, you know, if you have a lot of property, a lot of land, that is your wealth, like I said. That is the money, basically, that you would have or the currency that would you have. If someone referred to you as a wealthy man, they would measure that in the stock that you have. And I'm not talking about the stock, you know, that we would refer to today. I'm talking about animals. I'm talking about and then also the vineyards and all of that that they would have. So that would be their wealth. And you know what it does? It keeps wealthy people humble. That's what it does. You, the more money you get, it'll keep you humble. You know what it does is it keeps you in the state of mind of being gracious to people. You know, when you, know, it, when you do something in the beginning, someone commands you to do something. Like, I command my child and all my children to keep the laws of God. When they're, when they're real small, do they understand what they're doing? No, but they, they, over time, they will start to understand and then they will begin. Because they're doing it over time, they will begin to believe in those laws and to want to do those laws and desire to walk in God's law, right? Does everyone understand what I'm saying? Well, God commands them this, and maybe in the beginning a wealthy man may not even want to do it. He's like, man, I really want the rest of those corners. You know, I saw some good grapes over there, whatever, you know. He really wants to go glean it, but then over time he sees, you know, the widow. He sees Ruth. He sees all these people come, and what's he going to do? 
It's going to make you gracious at heart. God's laws are practical, not only to help out Ruth, not only to help out the fatherless, the widow, but it actually will help your character. When you follow God's law, and this is a good principle, even when you don't understand it, you need to follow God's law anyways, because there's a reason why he gave it to you. Even when you don't feel like it, and even when you don't have the right heart. I mean, it would be better to do God's law and not have the right heart than not to do it at all. So even when you don't have the right heart, you need to do it anyways. Because over time, what will happen is you will begin to desire to do it. Just like my children right now, you know, my daughter may not want to read the Bible every day. But you know what? As she grows and she starts to get her own mind and she reads all the time, the Bible says that God commanded the children of Israel to read it and to teach it to their children that they may learn to fear the Lord their God. Amen. Over time, she will learn to fear, fear the Lord her God, and she will begin to want and desire to do that. So this keeps people humble is what it does, and it makes wealthy people Feel, you know, gracious towards those that don't have much. Because, you know, people that have a lot of money have the tendency to think higher of themselves, don't they? I want you to look down there again. We'll read verse number three one more time. So we're back in Ruth chapter number two. We're going to look at verse number three. So he says, and she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reaper. So they're going in the barley harvest and they have whatever instruments they were using at that time. Tools where they're cutting down the stalks of barley, Right? And, and then you have the reapers that are cutting them down. That's who actually have those instruments. And then you probably have people that are going behind them that are actually putting them in, wrapping them up into a, into a uh, sheath, right? Sheaves, plural. They would be wrapping them up into sheaves. And then behind that, you're just going to have the extra, right? The, the little stragglers that they're going to miss here and there. Because they're going fast. You know, they're, they're getting it all together. They're not making sure they get everything if they're keeping God's law. So you have Ruth following behind, and she's just kind of picking up one here, picking up one there, right? That's what she's going there. That's the purpose that she's going there. And it says this, and her hat was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz. So her hat means like she happened to. She just so happened. So this is just chance. And it makes perfect sense because when, when God distributed the land, what did he do? He gave certain land to certain family members, right? So it makes perfect sense that when Naomi goes back and she inherits the land that she was living in in the first place, that it would be close by someone that is a relative, right? Boaz, because they all live close together. It says she, that her half was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. So they're related, the kindred. Verse 4, And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered him, the Lord bless thee. Now, now Judaism today has a false teaching about the third commandment. Does anybody know what I'm getting ready to say right now? They teach when the Bible talks about taking the Lord thy God's name in vain, that that means like you shouldn't even say his name. And that's, what, that's how they interpret the third commandment. And they say the only time, there's actually two sects. Some people say you can never say it. And if you ever read any like writings of, of Hebrews and Judaism and notice what they do with like even the word God or Jehovah, anyone ever notice? They'll put like a dash in there because they, you know, they say that we're not even supposed to say the name. That's what, how they interpret taking the Lord thy God's name in vain. This verse right here is a perfect example to say, to prove that that's not what this is teaching. Because notice just in casual conversation, they're going out and imagine your employer like Brother Hall walking up to you, you know, and, he, and how does he word it? And he's like, the Lord be with you. And then you, like, respond back. You're just at work. I mean, I'd be a great employer. I'd like to work somewhere like that. You know what I mean? And I just respond, respond back to him like, the Lord bless thee, right? I'd like to have a boss like that who, you know, loves the Lord as a Christian, right? I'd be real surprised. It's not very common. You know, they, I probably have some, like, discrimination stuff going against us nowadays. But, but my point was, what was my point? What was I saying right before that? Does anybody remember? Taking the Lord's name in vain. This disproves that, doesn't it? This disproves that because just casually you have a man of God and he just walks up to another person. He's like, the Lord bless thee. And the other guy's like, yeah, the Lord be with thee. And you have examples in the Bible where David is writing Psalms and he's saying, bless the name of the Lord. He doesn't say just bless the Lord. He says, bless the name of the Lord. Amen. How are you going to do that without saying the name of the Lord? It's ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. You know, if that's because a lot of people look at the nation of Israel today and they think like they're God's chosen people. We need to study their material and we'll learn about who God is. And they know deeper things than us. They rejected Jesus. Right, right. They reject God who wrote the law of the Old Testament, came down in the flesh and they're like, I don't, and they reject him. They didn't understand his voice. Right. They didn't know his voice. Why? Because they weren't of his flock. I, I, they can't understand God's word. And the Bible says that the Jews... When they're reading the Old Testament, they have a veil right. over their eyes. Right. 
That's what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 or 4. It says they have a veil. I definitely don't want, I don't want a guy like putting on a veil and he's like, let me tell you what the third commandment means. Yeah. Right, right. I don't need that guy telling me what the Bible says, right? right, right. I'm going to read the Bible. I have the Holy Spirit living inside of me and God will tell me Amen. what the third commandment means. Amen. You know what you're supposed to do? You compare spiritual things with spiritual things and we look at an example here. What do you have? The Lord be with thee. The Lord bless thee. So then you see them saying the name of the Lord. You see David, hey, praise the name of the Lord, right? Amen. So that's a false doctrine. Look at verse number five. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, whose damsel is this? So he notices, you know, uh, uh, Ruth at this time, the Moabitess woman. Verse six. And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, it is the Moabitess damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. So notice just everybody knows. So all, all I have to say, hey, it's, you know, it's the Moabitess woman that came back. Just like it says at the end of chapter 1, you know, when they returned, that everyone was talking about it, right? So it was a, a great stir. It wasn't common for someone of another country just to come in. You know, they had laws and stuff uh, about them coming and inheriting in the land. Verse 7, and she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reaper. So this is what Ruth said unto this servant. I, and she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheep. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. Now remember, this is actually Ruth's idea. You know what that shows is Ruth knows the Bible. You know, all these other nations, they, you say, oh, she knows that because all the other nations do the same thing. You remember when God gave the law to the nation of Israel, he said that what was going to be impressive unto all the other nations was the wisdom of the law. Because the law was so different. So it's not the same as all the other nations. It's not the same of Moab. That's what set them apart. And when, when they heard of those that lived in the nation of Israel, they would see their laws and they would say, what a wise people. So she actually learned this from the Bible. She knew, hey, hey Naomi, you know how the Bible teaches that? I'm going to actually go out there. I'm going to go ahead and do that. You know what it shows? It shows again to her character. You saw her integrity. Hey, I'm going with you, Naomi. I'm coming with you. Your people are going to be my people. Your God is going to be my God. And then what does she do as soon as she gets there? Somebody's got to provide for us, and there's no man in the home, so I'll go out and I'll get the food for us. You see, she's a great, she's a hard worker. She has, she's a woman of integrity, right? Look at, um, look at uh, verse, number, verse number seven. So it says here, look what it says at the end of the verse. So beginning with so there, right in the middle. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now. That she, and then it says that she tarried a little mouth. So just for, she took a little small break. So again, that speaks to her work ethic. That speaks to her being a hard worker. Verse 8, then said Boaz unto Ruth. So now he comes and he uh, confronts her and he says, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Saying, don't you hear me? Go not to glean in any other field, neither go from hence, from here. So he's saying, don't go to any other, fi any other field to glean. Don't even leave from here, but abide here fast by, the maid, by my maiden. So... The word fast there means like fasten. Like the word steadfast, it means to be like steady and to be fastened right where you're at. She's so saying, abide here fast, like right here, don't leave. You know, he's just stressing that, right? By my maiden. Verse number nine, let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. So he's repeating himself again. <clears throat> Once he says here, have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? So he's saying, I already commanded the young men that they wouldn't mess with you. And, and when thou art athirst, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. Verse number 10. Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? So you can see that, that Ruth is aware of the possibility of how she could have been treated. When she came into this land, why are you taking knowledge of me, seeing that I am a stranger? Why are you treating me this way? And you see all throughout the Bible the Jews looking down upon other nations. You see that taking place when Jesus walked the earth. You see that taking place in the Old Testament, in various situations, just over and over and over again. And I'm sure Ruth knew about that, and I alluded to that in chapter number one. And she's surprised that she's being treated so well. But you know what else you see about her character? You see her humility. Because look at what she says, verse 10. Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground. So she literally falls on her face and bows herself to the ground. Fell on her face and bows herself to the ground and said to him, why have I found grace in thine eyes? So she's looking, she's looking at herself and she's looking at him and she's like, you know, why are you treating me this way? Does it sound like she thinks very highly of herself? 
No, not at all, right? You know, like, it's like it reminds me of one of my favorite verses when Jacob is returning back and he's getting ready to meet Esau. And you can tell he's scared because, you know, Esau is a wild man. You know, Esau's coming out with a bunch of people. And he's like, you know, he, he prays to God. He's like, I am, not, I am not worthy of all the mercy and of all the truth which thou hast shown unto thy servant. So you see that humility. And this is the same humility we should have to God. She literally bows herself to the ground and she's like, why are you treating me so well? She, she's saying, I don't deserve this, right? And uh, notice what it, right after this, she says, why have I found grace in thine eyes? That thou shouldest take knowledge of me. So to even know, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him? Like David says. What are we? You know, and it's a perfect example of salvation. You know, when you come to God and you realize, hey, you need, that you need to be saved, you have to realize you're a sinner, don't you? You have to realize, I'm not good enough to get myself to heaven. I need someone else to save me. I, I need someone else to do that for me because I'm not good enough. You know, you see actually her, this same humility in verse number two, where she said, she says she's going to go out and glean, glean ears of corn after him. And she says, in whose sight I shall find grace. So she didn't know it was going to be Boaz at that time, but she's like, in, in his sight or whose sight I may find grace. So she's saying, hopefully she wants to find grace, right? In someone, in someone's eyes, someone's eyes. And what is grace? It's something you're not worthy of, right? It's mercy. It's unmerited favor is what it is. Now, I want to point out to you real quick, real interesting, a parallel in the Bible. I want you to go to, first I want you to go to John chapter number 4. John chapter number 4. Keep your hand there in Ruth chapter number 2. I keep saying that a little bit too late. Everybody's like dropping it, having to get it again. So go back if you haven't. I want to compare some scriptures. Ruth chapter 2. And we're going to look at, like I said, John chapter, chapter number 4. But I, if you were to notice, at the end of verse number 9, it says... Boaz says, and when thou art athirst, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. So notice he said, drink of that which the young men have drawn. So is she going to have to do any work for this? No, someone else is going to draw it, right? In the Bible, you know, there's obviously a surface meaning. There's obviously a literal meaning. But there are so many, thank you, there are so many times you see like, like we talked about Sunday night, typology, where you have a picture of someone. You have a picture of whoever it may be. And oftentimes, that picture is of the Lord Jesus Christ. Like when he's walking in Luke 24 on the road to, uh, uh, to Emmaus, and he's with Cleopas, and it doesn't tell you the other guy's name. What does he say? It says, and beginning at Moses, and in all the scriptures, he expounded unto them in all the, th all the things concerning himself. So what does that mean? In Moses, and in all the scriptures, he expounded unto them. All the things concerning himself. So that means that the book of Ruth is not immune to this. We should be able to find Jesus Christ in the book of Ruth. Amen. And, and you know what makes, what even further collaborates that is, you know, most of the time, the pictures, and the strongest pictures that you find of Christ are those that are in his lineage. Those that are a line of him. Isaac being a great picture of Christ. Genesis chapter number 22, when he takes him up to sacrifice him. Thy, thy son, thy only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, right? You have, you know, Abraham even in ways being pictured of Christ. You have David, prophecies which are prophesied about David, seemingly, end up being about Christ. All, you know, you have him speaking from the perspective of Christ when he's speaking by the mouth, by the Holy Spirit, right? You have Solomon, promises that are given to Solomon from David, which are actually given unto his seed, which was Christ, right? So you, oftentimes it will be people that are in the line of that seed because it's, it's picturing him until he comes. So he was able to expound on everything. So that means the book of Ruth is not immune to this, right? So it makes sense that Boaz would be a picture of Christ. Well, right here in Revelation chapter 22, I want to read to you real quick. So you have this in Revelation 22, the, one of the last things that Jesus says. He says, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto, unto you these things. And the church is, I am the root and the offspring of David and the bride and morning star. He said, and the spirit and the bride say, come and let him that heareth say, come and let him that is the thirst come. And he says, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Salvation is free. Amen. Water of life representing salvation, and it's free. Jesus Christ will give it to anybody. Right. You know, he'll give it to anybody, and you don't have to pay for it. You don't have to work for it. You know what it looks a lot like? The water that Boaz said, hey, go get that water. You don't have to do anything. The men will draw it. All you got to do is go over there and just receive it. Amen. An even stronger picture uh, you know, of this, not only just Jesus saying that he's offering that water, is in John chapter number 4. Because what you have in John chapter number 4 is you have... A stranger, just like Ruth. You have a stranger and you have a foreigner, right? You have a Samaritan. 
And she has exactly the same attitude. Look in John chapter number 4, verse number 2. Or actually, verse number three, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink, for his disciples were gone away into the city to buy me. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? Does that sound familiar? Like Just like when Ruth said, Who am I that thou wouldest take knowledge of, of me? Right? Notice that she's a Samaritan. She is a foreigner. And she comes to Jesus. She's like, you know, I'm a Samaritan. Why are you speaking to me? Right? Why are you asking me? Then ask a drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria. For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. You see, again, like I mentioned, the Jews... You know, we'll have that attitude oftentimes. Verse 10. Jesus answered and said unto her, I love this, If thou knewest the gift of who? Of God. Right? Now pay attention. If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that said to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him. Who? Who is speaking to him, right? And he would have given thee living water. Who's going to give the water? Who has the gift? God. Jesus is God. Amen. Right? You see that? He says, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that, that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Verse 11, The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up in everlasting life. This is a perfect verse to turn people to about, eternal, about salvation being eternal and eternal security. And I'll tell you why. He compares that water unto the water he's giving and saying, you see this water? You're going to drink it today. And you know what's going to happen tomorrow? You're going to get thirsty. And you know what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to come back here and get another drink. He, and then he says this, but the water that I give him, you're never going to thirst again. Right. You're going to drink this water one time, and you're never going to need to drink it again. You know what? A lot of Pentecostals believe, especially Pentecostals, they believe that they're getting resaved every week. Right? They got the wrong water. They don't have the water that Jesus was offering. They don't have the water that you drink there off one time, and you never thirst again. If they right. keep getting thirsty, if they keep getting thirsty every week, something's wrong. Right? right? You need to go to... The, the well of everlasting life that Jesus is, is offering. They're at the wrong Amen. well. Amen. Right? So it says right there, keep reading, <clears throat> verse number 15. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that sayest thou truly. Uh, verse 19, the woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in, in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Skip down, because we're going to pick this back up in just a moment. Skip down to verse uh, 24. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. You guys may have heard me say this before, but I strongly believe. You know, I can't prove this, but I believe that was a baiting question. Because he, he already said, if thou knewest who it was that speaketh of thee, that was the vast of him, and he would have given thee living one. So then she's like... You know, she starts thinking, and she's like, you know, I've heard that Messiah is coming, which is called Christ. When he comes, he'll teach us all things. Look what Jesus says next. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. He knows all, all everyone's thoughts, right? So he knows, like, if that's what's going on. She's like, wonder. She's like, I think you're the Messiah. So that's why she makes that statement. It's like a baiting question. We can't bait Christ. Obviously, he knows all thoughts and things like that. We're going to come back to this, okay? You can, you can lose it for just a moment. Go back to Ruth chapter number two again. I'm going to show you another parallel with that. But if you, if you, just to remind you, what did you see? You saw Boaz of the line of Christ being a type of Christ. And you see him here. And what happens? Ruth comes to him 
and she finds grace in his sight. Just like we come to Jesus and we find grace. And what is she? She's a stranger. What was the woman of Samaria? Of Samaria, she was a stranger, right? So you see this strong parallel. What does he give her? He gives her water. Boaz gives her water. How much does she have to work for it? Does she have to labor for it? Does she have to go even pour it? You don't even have to pour the glass, right? He, they pour it for him, and then they just gave it to her, and she just drinks it. You just have to receive it, right? That's all you have to do. It's free. And then what is Bo and Boaz does the exact same thing, and Jesus does the exact same thing. So you see these strong parallels, right? Amen. Keep looking there. Verse number, um, verse number 11. And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thy husband. So he knows all about what, what took place. And how thou hast left thy father and thy mother in the land of thy nativity, and are come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. Verse 12, the Lord recompense thy work. Another example of someone just speaking publicly and using the name of Jehovah, right? The Lord recompense thy work and a full reward be given thee of the, of the Lord God of Israel. Does anybody, Bible quiz real quick. Does anybody know where that phrase, where those two words, full reward, is found in the Bible? One other place. Full reward. Only one other place. Nobody? 2 John 8. It talks about that we, you know, we, that we would work, that we might not lose, you know, that we might get a full reward and might not lose the things which we wrought. Right? Does everybody remember now? Anybody? Anybody read the Bible? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so it says there, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. So notice what he said, under whose wings whom thou art come to trust, right? So notice the pattern here. She trusted the Lord, right? And this is just further proof that some people will teach this passage and just say, oh, she just wanted to go with Ruth. That's not all, or Naomi, that's not all that's going on. She made a vow unto the Lord, right? She believed in the Lord. She said, thy people are going to be my people, and thy God, my God. And what, is, what is, has uh, you know, Boaz say about her? The Lord, under whose wings thou art come to trust. So she believed in the Lord, right? She trusted God. And that's the first step, is you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You get saved. It's free. He offers the water free. But then the second step is that you start working. And what do you see Ruth doing? She goes out where? Into the field. She goes out and she starts reaping, right? She starts yeah. sowing. She starts reaping, right? Yeah. And what's going to happen? God will give you a reward for that. See, you don't work for salvation. You get salvation free and it's water and you just go there. Somebody else pours it for you and then they give it to you and you drink it. It's free. You don't do anything for it. Yeah. But then after that, because God is so gracious unto us, you know, he doesn't have to do anything else for you. You know, it was, you know, God could have just let you die and go to hell. But because he's loving, he gives us salvation. He allows us to go, you know, to, to drink up the water. And then he says, hey, go work out in the field and I'll pay you for it. Right. I want you to go back to John chapter number four. John chapter number four. John chapter number four, where we were. And I want you to look here in Ruth chapter two, still. Ruth chapter number 2, look at verse 13. We're going to use John 4 here in just a second. Ruth 2, 13 says, then, then she said, let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord. So we see her humility further. For that thou hast comforted me, and for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid. Though I be not like unto one of thy handmaids. See this, this pattern of this theme repeatedly of her being a stranger. She, I, you know, I would guess that she probably looked different than the Israelites as well. I would say you could probably look at her and say, hey, you're not an Israelite. You know, she looked and she said, I'm not like your, your other handmaids, right? There's a difference in her. And you know what? The Bible says that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek. It doesn't matter. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon. It doesn't matter what, you know, ethnicity you are. Uh, what matters is if you are of the nation of God. Right. And how do you become an Israelite, a true Israel? Israelite is being circumcised of the heart by faith. Right? Amen. right? He is right. not a Jew which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly. That's right. That's what matters. You know, the color of your skin, that doesn't matter at all. It doesn't matter where you were born. It doesn't matter at all. Jesus said... That my house shall be a house of prayer in all nations. Right. right? If people want to try to divide you know, in ethnicities, whether it be the KKK or the black Hebrew Israelites, they're both stupid. And neither right. one of them understand the Bible. Amen. The Bible teaches that it doesn't matter what color your skin is. What matters is whether or not you are in Christ. That's Amen. what matters. It doesn't matter whether you're male or female, whether you're Jew or Gentile. It matters whether you're in Christ. Amen. And what does Boaz say? He doesn't care, does he? He, he has the right attitude. They were supposed to treat the strangers, the, you know, 
properly in the same way as others. And people have this weird idea about the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. The Bible says in the Old Testament that many became Jews. So if that meant that you, if, if, if being a Jew was of the line that you were born of, how could you become a Jew? It would be impossible. Right? It says that many became Jews at the, at the end of the book of Esther. How would that happen? It's because, just like, just like uh, Ruth here, she ends up, I'm sure, you know, spoiler alert, she ends up marrying Boaz, right? And she becomes of the nation, she becomes a Jew, right? Does it make perfect sense? Right. And not only that, people act like, oh, you had to be of, you know, the nation of Israel. Ruth and Boaz spawned the child, which would someday be the progenitor to Christ. So Christ was not even fully of Abraham's seed, if you want to think of it strictly, right? right, right. He's also a Moabite. Ooh. <laughs> he was. People act weird about that, don't they? They yeah. think, like, like, if you said that to somebody, like, you know, Jesus was a Moabite? Like, people that are just, like, obsessed with Israel? Be like, how dare you? That's Bible. Right. That's what the Bible teaches. Amen. He was also a Moabite. You know why? Because it doesn't matter. Right. It Amen. doesn't matter. Right. You know, the strangers could inherit the land and they could become a Jew, Right? So look there, uh, keep reading. I want to show you something here in Ruth chapter 2. Keep reading there, verse 14. And Boaz said unto her, At mealtime, come thou hither, and eat of the bread, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, and he reached her parched corn, and she did eat, and was sufficed and left. And it said, verse 15, you see her going back out after she was given permission. And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves. And reproach her not, and let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her, and leave them, that she may glean them, and rebuke her not. So you see her being sent out into the field, right, to do work, right? Given grace first, and then you get a full reward for your works. Look over at John chapter number 4, another parallel with this same passage. Look down at uh, verse 28. The woman then left her water pot. And went her way into the city, and saith to them, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Verse 30. Then they went out of the city and came unto him. In the meanwhile his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? No, he just got somebody saved. And that's what keeps him going. Verse 34, Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye there are yet, look at this, four, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. So he's likening all those that are coming right now. She went and told her, hey, I spoke to a man, I'm pretty sure this is the Christ. And you just have multitudes of people coming to see him. And he's like, look up. It's time for the harvest now, right? Don't, don't say four months and then come to the harvest. The harvest is coming now. They're getting ready to start reaping, right? They're getting ready to start going soul winning. Amen. And what is, I, don't, I can't remember exactly where it's located, but in Psalms it talks about, you know, the man that goeth forth, forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, Amen. bringing his sheaves with him. What's that talking about? It's talking about taking the word of God, the seed of the word. The seed is the word. When Jesus interprets the parable, taking the word of God and going out there and preaching it. Right. Putting the word of God under your arm and going and knocking doors and going soul winning. And then you're gathering up some sheaves and you're bringing them into church. Or Amen. you're sending them to Pastor Palacio's church if they don't speak English, right? <laughs> so look at what it says next to Verse 36. And he that reapeth, look at this, receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. That both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. So who sowed in this case? Jesus, because he preached unto that woman. The woman went out. She took part in that also. She sowed. And then they're coming out, and they're getting ready to finish leading these people and preaching the gospel to them and get them saved, right? And then they're going to reap, and what are they going to get? You know, they're going to get rewards. And what did it say over there? That the Lord was going to give them a full reward. That's what Boaz said unto Ruth, that she was going to receive a full reward. And what was she doing? She was gleaning, right? She was going out, and she was in, in the harvest, the barley harvest. <clears throat> Another interesting, real quick parallel, uh, we're going to blow through the end of this, so I'm not going to go on forever, but go back to Ruth 2, look at verse 14, and then get Luke 12, 37. Luke 12, 37 in your other hand. That's Luke chapter number 12, verse number 37. But look again, like I said, remember that Boaz is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have in Ruth chapter number 2, verse number 14, And Boaz said unto her at mealtime, Come thou hither, and eat of the bread, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, 
and he reached her parts of corn and she did eat and was sufficed and left. So notice, he, gave her, he had somebody else pour the water and then also what's going on? Jesus Christ also representing the bread. This right here, they're actually eating. This is bread. We talk about parched corn. You read and study it up even further in the Bible. Parched corn is not corn like we would think of. They're dipping this. Do you take, do you, take uh, you know, a, a corn on the cob and dip it in like vinegar? No, you don't do that, right? You take, you know, bread and dip bread. And, you know, and this actually parallels the Lord's Supper where they have bread and wine, right? You see that over and over again in the Bible. You'll see corn and wine. Just study if you have like a Bible app. Type in corn and wine. You'll see it pop up all the time. You know what else you'll find? Bread and wine, because it's the same thing. Corn is just in a different stage. It's when it's a seed, right? And sometimes, look, right here when it's parched corn, it'll be referred to that as well. But notice, Boaz is serving her, right? And you say, how does that make sense with Boaz being a picture of Christ? Well, look at Luke chapter 12, verse 37. Luke chapter 12, verse 37. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Talking about when he comes back, the Lord Jesus Christ, those servants are blessed, those that keep watching. He says, Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them sit down to me and will come forth and serve them. What do you got there? Boaz being a picture of Christ and him coming. He's serving her. Boaz is a man of mighty wealth. I mean, that's, you may blow over your head, but that's a pretty interesting picture. You know, I thought when I read this every time, I think like Boaz must be a hard worker because he could probably be kicked back in his palace or something. But he goes out there and he's like checking on stuff. I mean, he's got, you know, tons of servants. You understand what I'm saying? He doesn't need to go out there. We want to make sure like, hey, I want to make sure everything's going right. I'm going to go out because he's not lazy. He's going to go out there and he's going to check on stuff, right? He's a hard worker. And then what do you see? Ruth being a hard worker, right? And then this passage, you see Boaz, who is a man of great wealth, and he's serving her. The Lord Jesus Christ, you know, God in the flesh, he says one day he's going to serve us. What did he do with the Lord's Supper? He girds himself, right? He gets a towel and he washes their feet, right? You see, the, what is it? A great picture of humility. Amen. You know, you, the Lord Jesus Christ, the God of gods, the Lord of lords, the King of kings. And you can't humble yourself. I wouldn't point just to you, Josh. Everybody's like, what did Brother Josh do, right? Yeah, you know, you, we need to humble ourselves, right? If the Lord, the Lord of Lords can humble himself, then we for sure should be humble, right? Amen. Amen. Look at uh, verse number 16, especially Brother Josh. No, I'm just kidding. Verse number 16. It says, and let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose. We would, we would word this like on purpose. He's saying like purposely drop stuff for her. You know, when you, when, don't, like, don't be diligent, right? I'm sure he's not saying, like, leave everything, but purposely just let handfuls drop so that she can have an abundance, right? This is, you know, and another thing that's cool about this is he's saying, per, you know, I'm, he's giving her protection. So when you go out soul winning, you know, people are like, man, it's a bad area. I'm worried about it. Don't be worried. Don't be worried because God already, he has everything in his hands. Amen. He's going to make sure that you're protected, right? Amen. He's going to make sure that God has his hand over you. Just like Boaz, the Lord Jesus Christ was like, don't rebuke her. Don't, don't scold her. Don't correct her. Let her go. Right? And then you see that the, the same picture when you have us going out and soul winning. This is a picture of that. Look at verse number uh, 17. So she gleaned in the field until even and beat out that she had gleaned. So beating it out is like she has it like in the stalk, if you will. Exactly. I, I don't know exactly what you refer to it as. I believe stalk. That, yeah, I called it that earlier. And they would beat it out so it would just get the seeds and then she would gather up the seeds. So uh, it says, and, and it was about an ephod of barley. Now, for the measurements, you know, informational sake on the measurement, if you look up ephod, I, I believe the second time it comes up is when they, there's a, a, a you know, omer, there's an omer is mentioned. And it tells you that, that an omer is one-tenth of an ephod. An omer is a tenth of an ephod, and an omer is the amount, is the amount of the manna that they put into a pot. Not only that, so that sounds about like a meat, one meal for one person, right? You know, they're not putting a ton in there. It went in the Ark of Covenant. So in one pot. Yeah, further proof that it is one meal is that um, if you look up Omer again, in addition to that, you know, you'll see that the priest, you remember how daily they had to bring offerings and then the priest would eat it? Well, that was an Omer. So that shows you like, you know, definitively that it is, it is one, it's a measurement that one person's going to sit down and eat. And an ephah is, is, you know, one-tenth of an omer. Or an omer is one-tenth of an ephah. Therefore, she's bringing basically home ten meals right now in one day. I mean, that's a good day. I mean, if you get ten meals in one day, you know, you're making pretty good money, right? I mean, if we're to add up how much does it cost for an average meal, and you think, you know, obviously things work different. That was a bad example, right? It's like not very much money at all. You guys are broke. Look at that now. 
and she, verse 18, and she took it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned, and she brought forth and gave to her that she had reserved after she was sufficed. So she ate, and then she could see that she gave everything after she had eaten all of that day's worth. She gave that unto Naomi. So you can see she loves Naomi, but also she's, what? She's serving the Lord. Even Boaz said that, right? She's doing this not only, you know, for the love that she has for her mother-in-law, what her mother-in-law had done for her, but because she's doing it for the Lord. And she knows that she'll receive reward because we serve a just God. Just like Boaz is just and he's giving picture of Christ, God is just and he'll give us what we deserve, right? <clears throat> Verse 19, and her mother-in-law said unto her, where hast thou gleaned today? And where wroughtest thou? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. And she, and she showed her mother-in-law. So right now, Ruth has no clue who, who Boaz is. And Naomi is like, where did you get all of this? Like, she's surprised, you know, because it's a lot. She wouldn't have gotten this anywhere else. Mother-in-law, with whom she had wrought, it says, and said, the man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz. Verse 20. And Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord, who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. The living is referring to Naomi, and Ruth and the dead is referring to, of course, you know, Elimelech, Malon, Kilion, the two brothers that passed away, right? And uh, living to the dead, and Naomi said unto her, the man is near of kin unto us, one of our next kinsmen. I'm, I think Naomi's probably already thinking, like, you should probably marry him. You know what I mean? She, I'm sure she knows he's single, right? And uh, verse 21, and, the, and Ruth the Moabitess said, he said unto me also, thou shalt keep fast by my young men until they have ended all my harvest. So every day she gets to go back and she has... If she has that amount every day, I mean, at that time, that's a lot that she's bringing home. You can even see Naomi is surprised, right? She's like, wow, this is a lot. And in uh, verse number 22, And Naomi said unto Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that thou go out with his maidens. Watch what it says, too, that they, might, that they meet thee not in any other field. So notice this over and over again, like how, like I, I started off in chapter number 1 explaining this concept, how the Jews, like, if you're a foreigner, you're not treated well, right? If you're a stranger, you're not treated well. This is the same thing today. You know, the Jews have this attitude that they are better than, you know, the Gentiles. They're better than anyone who's not of the physical line of the Jews. And at that time, he's like, it's good that you can go to there, there to that field and reap, and that you can glean this, and you have protection. Because if they find you anywhere else, they might do something to you. That's why I have to speak even to, you know, uh, his, his servants, the men. Like, don't rebuke her. You know, why does he have to tell them that? Because he believes that it's very possible they could, right? So look, uh, look there at the end, verse 23. So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of barley harvest and of wheat harvest and dwelt with her mother-in-law. So like I said earlier, so it's, uh, it was March. Yeah, it would begin in March and end in May was uh, barley harvest. And then wheat harvest, if you look it up, it actually begins in May, so right after that, and ends in July. So it's about a month and a half, these, these periods of time, one right after another, barley first. And barley actually begins at basically the same time as, uh, as the, the, the first month of it, right? Everybody's familiar with that? That's the exact same time, basically. Kind of, obviously, it can vary year by year, depending on the frost and stuff the year before. But yeah, about a month and a half first, and beginning in March... For barley harvest, once that's ended almost immediately thereafter, you have wheat harvest. And notice that she's gleaning for both of these. So she gets to do the first harvest and the second harvest. That's why it says at the end, until they have ended, ended all my harvest. Now, chapter number one, I explained why I believe that they should not have left. You remember, everyone remember that? I don't believe that it was God's will for them to leave the land of Israel. What happened immediately? I mean, it, you know, shortly thereafter, her husband dies. Then what happened? Both of her sons died. I mean, look at the coincidence of that, right? And then what does she say? The Lord hath dealt with me very bitterly. She says to, she says to uh, Ruth and to Orpah, she's like, I feel bad for you because the Lord has stricken me so poorly. And they're living with him, right? And then she comes back and she tells everybody, you know, call me no longer Naomi, which means like blessed or pleasant, something along those lines. She's like, but call me Mara, for the Lord hath dealt very bitterly with me. Now, I think that it's conclusive. That's a lot of evidence right there. But think about this. What is the, what is the, uh, you know, what is the picture, if you will, of a blessing? It's like reaping, you know, how much food they have, right? Not being in a famine, the exact opposite. And what happens as soon as they get black, back? What are they, what's happening? They're being blessed immediately. You see what I'm saying? It makes perfect sense. As soon as they come back, they're being blessed. 
Everyone understand? So, there was no re God never told them to leave because of the famine. They should have just trusted God that they could have made it through that famine. That's what they need to do. That's what we need to do. We're in a hard time. Don't run away from church. Don't run away from the Bible. Man. You know, if you stay, you'll get the blessing. If you stay, God will help you through it, and then you become stronger. And what type of attitude did, did, did she come back with? Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. For the Lord had dealt very bitterly with me. She says, I, I went out full and came back empty. She had a good attitude. She has a poor attitude. She has a bad attitude. She's depressed. You know, she would have stayed there. She probably would have had her husband still. She would have had her sons, right? Obviously, God can use any situation. Just like God used Joseph and he said, you meant and told his brothers, you meant it for evil, God meant for good. God brought good out of it and Ruth came back and ended up being, you know, a progenitor of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Their good came out of it, but that was not God's will. God can still use you. That just shows, that, you know, he has second chances. He's not done with you. They shouldn't have left in the first place. So you're not supposed to leave. Never leave the church. No, I'm just kidding. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, for the Bible. We thank you, dear Lord, for that we can find you on every page. We love you so much. We ask you to bless our church and be with us, dear God. And just please continually open our understanding to the scriptures and help us to have the attitude that, uh, that Ruth had of just being humble, dear Lord, and, uh, and being a hard worker. All the characteristics that she had, dear Lord. She's a great example. And also Boaz keeping the law of the Old Testament and allowing her to glean, dear Lord. We ask you that we would look at the great examples and that we would follow them and that you would just continually open our, open our understanding, as I said, and bless all the families that are here tonight and be with Pastor Palacios and his church, dear God. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen. amen.